Hello again, and this presentation is called Theoretical Reasons for the Long Detour. And by that long detour, I'm referring to the avoidance of evolutionary biology in the 20th century. So if we return again to the 19th century emergence of the four fields of anthropology, the key decade when those fields really gelled was the 1860s. And it's in the 1860s that uh, anthropology comes together. And this was the decade of Darwin. So historians uh, who take intellectual historians sometimes speak of the long 1860s. And we can begin the long decade of the 1860s in the year 1859 and it's in 1859 that Darwin publishes The Origin of Species and then we can put a cap on this long decade in the year 1871 and this is when Darwin published The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. So uh, the decade that anthropology emerged is also the decade of Darwinian thinking emerging. And one might think uh, that anthropology would have emerged from Darwin's thought at that time, but in fact, across all four subfields, it took quite a while to come to terms with Darwin. And it's worth uh, emphasizing that the 1860s was crowded uh, with a thinkers on progress, or what came to be called by 20th century social scientists, the evolutionist, uh, Herbert Spencer and Edward Tyler. Uh, there were many evolutionary thinkers, and intellectual historians long ago uh, demonstrated that it's a myth that Darwin set all this thinking in motion. Uh, for the most part, the early anthropologists ignored Darwin or considered their own ideas much better than his. And from the perspective of anthropology at the time, he was one thinker among many. And evolutionary anthropology was shaped more, arguably, by Herbert Spencer and Edward Tyler and Lewis Henry Morgan and others uh, than it was by Charles Darwin. So even what we call 19th century evolutionary anthropology had relatively little to do with Darwin at the time uh, during the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, evolution was marginalized, as we noted, in reaction to the racism and ethnocentrism of the 19th century anthropologists. And in counter to this, we get the emphasis on cultural relativity and cultural determinism in sociocultural anthropology, as well as the other social sciences. And through most of the 20th century, uh, through the center of it anyway, and in many social scientists until the present, we have uh, very little interaction with evolutionary biology and this is largely for ideological reasons. But there were also theoretical reasons why evolutionary biology was marginalized in the 20th century. And this followed from the tremendous emphasis that was placed on culture and the baggage, the, the set of meanings that culture carried with it in Western thinking. And all of this together uh, pushed evolution into a very small part of the study of living humans and living communities. So one theme in cultural thinking is the idea that culture is outside of the genes, it's outside of biology, and this is often expressed in the argument that culture is extragenetic as a, as a core to the definition of culture. A second theme is that humans are unique, and what makes them unique is culture. And so this introduces a gap between humans and all other living things, uh, just as the stress on the extragenetic introduces a gap between humans and human biology. 
So to study humans from a cultural perspective means you don't have to look at humans in relation to other living organisms and the other primates, for example, nor do you have to look at humans in relation to our own biology or uh, uh, certainly the explanatory principles of evolutionary biology. And lastly, uh, cultural thinking in the 20th century and social thought was focused on groups and collectives. And a lot of evolutionary theory uh, focused on individuals. And this also added uh, to the barrier uh, between the social sciences and evolutionary biology. So if we put these three ideas together, evolution was pinned again into a very small uh, corner of the study of living humans and human societies. So we can say that in the social sciences in the 20th century, evolution simply stopped. In terms of intellectual study, it hit a red light and instead the green light was given to the study of culture uh, without connection to biology or other living things. So if you ask most social scientists and social cultural anthropologists, does evolution make sense of other living things? They'd say, oh yes. But does it explain humans? They'd say no. So evolution, that idea that evolution is explanatory, it works for chimpanzees, our closest living relatives. It doesn't work for humans. Similarly, if you ask them, well, uh, does evolution not matter at all for humans? They'd say, well, it mattered in the distant past. Indeed, you know, we get back there in, in this human lineage. And at some point there, yeah, evolution matters and paleoanthropologists should deal with evolution. But then culture evolved. And once humans have culture, evolution has no significance. And so the social sciences simply rolled forward focused on culture. And that pushed biology and evolution out the door. Um, culture preempted the discussion of the evolution of human behavior it simply wasn't part of social cultural anthropology or the other social sciences. So if we diagram for filled anthropology in the century of culture, uh, from the early 20th century to the late 20th century, we find that three of the four fields focus on culture, linguistics, uh, social cultural anthropology, and archaeology. And only one field, physical anthropology, deals with biology and evolution. And of course, uh, linguistics and archaeology came to terms with physical anthropology and biology first. And cultural anthropology was the most removed from that. And that probably had to do with the focus on living peoples and the strength of that reaction against 19th century ethnology. Um, but if physical anthropology was a very small and limited enterprise in the early 20th century, it was the fastest growing uh, uh, combination of sciences uh, by the latter 20th century. And most cultural anthropologists simply didn't recognize how rapidly biology was developing. But increasingly, at least some uh, cultural anthropologists came to realize that this focus on culture wasn't explaining humans very well. Um, don't genes matter, at least in some ways? Doesn't our biology matter? Um, is culture really uniquely human? How could something so decisively different evolve uh, with no precedence? And are individuals really uh, determined by learned culture? Uh, aren't there any universals that all humans share? And gradually out of this dissatisfaction uh, with the ability of culture to make sense of human behavior, uh, we get a return of evolution uh, to the study of human communities. But this return is powered not by what happens inside anth social cultural anthropology or the social sciences, but rather by what's happening in biology. So in the 1960s, we see a return of Darwin. 
This is called uh, neo-Darwinian uh, biology sometimes. And gradually evolutionary biologists start to claim chunks of the domain of the social sciences and social cultural anthropology. So one chunk comes to be uh, claimed by Darwinian social theory, another chunk by evolutionary psychology, uh, which focuses on evolved dispositions, and yet another by human behavioral ecology, uh, which focuses on explaining animal behavior. And then if we can explain animal behavior, can, can we try to apply those same principles to humans? And Darwinian social theory focuses on uh, social life and the evolution of social life. So this is uh, these three perspectives are going to be at the heart of this course. Uh, the application of evolutionary approaches to human behavior. And we're going to have relatively little to say about sociocultural anthropology, even though we're focusing on the same uh, subject matter. So this is our focus this semester, human behavioral ecology, Darwinian social theory, and evolutionary psychology. And in the concluding segment, we're going to focus in on what's called dual inheritance theory, which is a new approach to thinking about culture. So there's another way we can map out uh, the class. At the broadest level, we're interested in understanding evolution, but we're quickly going to focus in uh, from evolution generally to behavioral adaptations and then from behavioral adaptations generally to those that are related to social life and cooperative behavior. And within that, we're primarily going to focus on living human communities, but in a broad comparative perspective to other primates. And in focusing on living human communities, we're particularly interested in uh, reproduction, we're, we're going to spend four weeks on the evolution of human reproductive behavior and four weeks on the evolution of humans food getting and food sharing behavior or subsistence. And then we'll come back in the last four weeks to new approaches to culture and efforts to integrate culture into evolutionary biology. So here's a summary of where these three presentations have been. Uh, we said that in the 1860s, the first foundations were laid for evolutionary approaches to human behavior, uh, but those went awry and focused on, uh, became ideologically imbricated, and uh, that uh, removed them from serious consideration uh, from the late 19th through most of the 20th century. And then in the 1960s, new foundations were laid for evolutionary approaches to human behavior. And it's those new foundations that we're going to build from. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.